Hello, everyone in the uh, audience. Thanks for having me here at Dev Club. Um, as Edgar has already introduced me, my name is Andreas. Uh, I've been a developer at the, a small Estonian startup called Klaus for a bit over two and a half years now, closing in on three years. Um, and I was one of the first employees, and I thought it would be a good idea to maybe share my experience, uh, namely as as an like early developer and in the shoes of an engineer and uh, what kind of challenges a startup goes through and uh, uh, from the perspective of, of, of me as, a, as an engineer instead. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it not as technical as Edgar has uh, promoted it, so uh, hopefully everyone can relate to certain bits of it. Um, so firstly, Klaus as a product, it's uh, a conversation review tool. Um, it's a term that we coined. Um, it, it basically means something like uh, code reviews, but they are for your customer support conversations and chats. So whenever you hear this recording at the start of a phone call, this call is being recorded for quality purposes, etc. then we are one of those more modern uh, takes on the platform where you can actually perform those reviews and go over your chats, calls, um, tickets, emails, etc. We've raised over 6 million euros by now, uh, within three years, and uh, we were backed by, uh, at least I think, some pretty impressive names. Uh, so our investors include the early investors of companies like Revolut, uh, Slack, and Spotify. Mm. We're a bit shy of 30 employees right now, but we're constantly growing. Um, and on our platform, to uh, give you a rough estimate of the activity that we see, uh, roughly a, a bit under 100,000 unique reviews get performed each month, and uh, we're a truly remote company. We don't we don't just advertise that, and I I'll go into that a bit later as well. Uh, but I think uh, it has served us uh, really well being fully remote. Uh, we do have a small office in Tallinn, uh, but it's it's mainly empty. <laughs> uh, you don't see a lot of people in the office actually, um, and because we. Um, need to sync up with the user's uh, help desk software, which is usually where the uh, customer conversations and chats uh, live. Then um, architecturally, uh, te technologically, it's, uh, it's very intriguing and interesting dealing with huge volumes. So we import and sync roughly 100 mil uh, sorry, 1 million conversations every day. And uh, that, that number keeps growing with every new customer we acquire. Uh, so we're, we're dealing with very interesting volume challenges as, as well. Um, and throughout those volume challenges, we're, we're pretty proud that we can still ship very often uh, and iterate quite fast as a company. Um, some of our clients today include companies uh, like Automatic. Uh, they were actually our very first customer. They're the makers of WordPress.com and uh, Jetpack, et cetera. I, I hope you've heard of them. Uh, then other big names like SoundCloud, Doodle, uh, Epic Games, where the make makers of Fortnite, Hotjar, etc. Um, and so that's where Klaus is today. And my main talk today is to walk you through the history of Klaus and how we actually got here. Um, so jumping back all the way to the beginning, uh, we have our three founders uh, from the left. This is Martin, this is Egon, and this is Kair. Uh, Martin is, in 2017, working as the head of global customer support at a company called Pipedrive. Um, and he has scaled uh, the customer support team at Pipedrive from the very early days when they were just a handful of support agents um, to a pretty large support team by now. And so he's looking at how like he could track internally the quality of their customer support besides only sending out CSAT surveys. Uh, if you ever come across this small questionnaire uh, where they ask you, how likely are you to recommend our services to a friend or something, um, then that's only half of the story um, because the client itself only maybe had one interaction with you and your company, uh, but, but your support agents, they have thousands of interactions maybe, and, and you should actually measure the quality of that support service internally rather. Uh, so Martin was really um, pained by the process that he had set up. Uh, he basically had a huge Excel spreadsheet, as a lot of companies do. Uh, 
And in that Excel spreadsheet, you just mark down the either maybe a chat or a conversation ID, and then you just mark down the uh, customer support person who dealt with that client, and, and then you review the conversation manually and you kind of mark down some notes, etc. cetera. But uh, the more you do it, the more the spreadsheet grows, and eventually it took Martin minutes to just like initially load up the spreadsheet and, and show any type of data. So it was very painful, and it wasn't a process that anyone would kind of love when you do it that manually. Um, so you might put it off at times, et cetera, because it's, it, there's so much friction in there. Um, and the good thing about friction is if, if you have the right amount of friction and, and you're willing to suffer through it, then friction creates spark. Um, so Martin and his good friend, Kair, on the right there, um, they've had some smaller um, startup ideas and, and endeavors before. Um, but then this time, Martin had this great uh, domain knowledge because it's customer support. It, it's uh, very uh, friendly waters for him. And uh, Kair at the time was actually the head of growth at Pipedrive. So Kair had huge marketing knowledge to bring with him. And, and they uh, set out to find a developer who would build the very first prototype. Mm -hmm. Kair and Egon, Egon is the person in the middle on the picture, uh, they had worked together at a different company in the past on some smaller projects. So Kair knew that Egon was this very uh, down-to-earth, grounded developer who was just, he didn't like the fluff talk, etc. He was like, all right, just give me the details and let's build this. Um, and I think that's a great like early profile for a, for a developer that you're looking for in a startup, I think it's someone who's like willing to just put in the work, get dirty. Um, so I gone built the prototype. Um, it was a small Laravel application at the time. Uh, and what it basically did was whenever you just um, in the app, you saw the conversations that you also had in your help desk. Uh, and when you clicked on a conversation in the list, then it actually went and contacted your help desk's API and uh, fetched you the ticket and you could leave it some comments and a rating, like a thumbs up, thumbs down. It was pretty primary, but the main point was that this prototype was supposed to sell the vision of what Klaus would one day be. So um, if, if Martin or Gaida would approach someone at a conference or, or anywhere uh, with this idea that, hey, we're trying to build this thing, then your prototype doesn't have to show the bells and whistles and what it's going to eventually be because if you if you uh, spend the time building it for that long, then someone else is going to get there first, or um, yeah, you, you might just miss the train. So the very first prototype that they had, um, it just had to get the things done. Um, here's a short image of it as well. Sorry. Um, so it has the tickets here in the list, and then it has the conversation of the ticket. You can rate it and leave a comment, and that's mostly it. Um, and then when Egon first heard the pitch, was he was into it. Uh, he started building it, and they uh, met after hours, actually, after their main jobs, because everybody had a full-time job as well. They worked on it on the side. Um, uh, they worked at a, a. They met up in a in a small pub in Tallinn, um, and the pub owner actually had like reserved them a special seat or room in the back that uh, they always took, and where they always sat at. So it was either weekly or, or in the evenings, even multiple times a week, when Egon would meet up with Martin and Kair, and he would get some feedback on the work that he had, he had done on the prototype. Um, <laughs> And then eventually they got to a point where they were willing to share it because uh, they felt that this this product itself you can kind of mm, get through the happy flow, which means that you can, if you're an ideal user, you can log into the app, click on a conversation, um, and then review the conversation itself. And and that already is a huge step forward if you're working with Excel spreadsheets or or even if you haven't heard of a like, uh, support QA process in the first place, then this is quite eye-opening already. So they launched the MVP, they put it online, um, they start approaching people, um, and then at a conference, Martin actually gives a talk about support QA and, and shows Klaus and his prototype. 
And right after the talk, uh, the head of support at, at Automatic, uh, Valentina, approaches Martin after the talk, and, and she's like, "I'm in. This look, looks good. Let's let's try it out." Um, and hearing that from a client is very sort of invigorating, and it, it like verifies your idea that that you are actually on the right track. So it's, I think it's crucial to show your work always um, as early of a stage as possible and as close to an actual client or, or like target group user base as possible. So even though you often have like good friends or, or colleagues who you can validate some ideas for you or, or tell you that this, this idea won't work because of X, uh, it's, it's always good to actually find the people who would eventually start using the product and just vet the idea on them instead. Um, and, and secondly, it's it's really important to honor your first clients uh, or first users uh, because they're they're also taking a huge leap and risk with with you as a as a brittle startup uh, because you might not be that stable you might not have the uh, especially in uptime or, or features you might be a bit buggy uh, so you need to make them feel heard uh, heard uh, honor their feedback always. Uh, Never just uh, dismiss something that they say, um, and uh, you you also get a very very fast feedback loop um, when instead of just developing to yourself silently, because uh, you, you now finally have real users, live users that are using it daily or weekly, um, and you should like take their first early feedback as gold. It, it might spot some issues that you just didn't see because often when developing or prototyping you're so down the road in a narrow tunnel and the user they enter the like user flow from the very start of the tunnel so they get to go through it all over again with fresh eyes so Klaus now finally had their first paying uh, customer and they actually landed a second one as well uh, Bandadoc um, and after having to paying customers now, they thought we should find some funding. Um, so they got sort of a pre-seed funding round, a very small amount of money uh, to uh, kind of build out the prototype a bit more, furbish it, um, and find some first employees. Now it's quite tricky to uh, profile what to look for in an early employee because you'll need like very passionate multi-tools you need people who can adapt to almost any situation, but at the same time, you can't just uh, throw them into a burning room uh, and just tell them, okay, let's see how you get out of this. And uh, oh, by the way, you should also handle this um, customer complaint at the same time or, or something completely different that's out of their field. Um, so it's it's quite, quite tricky to uh, sort of know that this person will be the right fit in a company or, or in a like hectic environment that a startup is. But at the same time, it's it's already great if you find a person willing to like take the early risk because oftentimes your your idea might not amount to something. It's just the reality sometimes. But if you find the right right person who's very passionate, I think like I, I think the adaptability and is is often more important than just raw skill or or talent because uh, oftentimes there are people with with great talents, but they might just not handle the pressure of a startup or or not like working three, four different roles at the same time. Um, so it's the summer of 2018 now, uh, and Klaus has got their funding. They're looking for new employees, um, and that's where I come in as well. So I joined Klaus at July of 2018, um, and another uh, backend developer joined with me. And uh, we looked at a lot of an application, and, and it it did great in delivering the message and vision of close, but uh, we both with the new backend developer at the time thought it had some kind of uh, shortcomings in terms of if we wanted to scale this app now to hundreds of uh, companies, then we couldn't in real time hit their help desk API points because we would just hit the rate limits there, especially if they had hundreds or thousands of users using Klaus. So we had to re-envision re the uh, architecture of the ap application a bit and our service. Um, 
And, and I know it sounds very stereotypical of a developer to uh, come into a new job and there's like a hard spoken rule for a developer that everything before me is bad and I will make it better. And, and like version two will be faster and prettier if we just got to build it again. But at the same time, uh, a prototype very well for your start it might be something that you scrap later. Um, so it's just important to hear maybe the more rational arguments that the developers or new people bring. And, and it's often that you do bring the, the uh, new firepower to your team for that very reason and occasion that they have the ability to speak their mind and lend their hand and maybe rebuilding everything. So in September 2018, uh, we sort of freeze our current product or the prototype. And uh, we start building a proper version one from scratch. Um, at the same time, our CEO and a salesperson that we managed to sort of get on board and help us out, uh, the two of them are out there doing a lot of uh, sort of cold outreach to people. And uh, it's also a lot of educational work because oftentimes uh, as a startup, you're, you're doing something disruptive, either something brand new or you're changing something existing. And it's not always just about selling, it's also about educating people. So if you just go to someone and like, oh, would you like to buy my support QA tool? Then most of the times you get an answer that's no, because they might not even know what like support QA is, even though if they do work in the industry. Um, so a lot of the outreach also involved um, teaching people. That also meant we had to create some like um, content um, and we had to start up a blog and educate people. Um, and that resulted in a lot of positive uh, inbound sales. So people did come onto our blog because they were maybe looking up support QA themselves. And that was a nice way they found us. But uh, to th their disappointment, the, um, the prototype that we had often didn't uh, meet their demands. Like maybe they wanted something more granular than just the thumbs up, thumbs down, or, or maybe their help desk was something that we didn't yet integrate with, et cetera. So um, business had, had a pretty tricky time, I think, balancing these new requests uh, from these new leads. Uh, and, and uh, kind of saying no to some of them because at the same time we were building everything from scratch. So we just couldn't allow that much feature creep. But at the same time, uh, what we discovered uh, later was that this kind of very fast iteration and meeting the client halfway. So if they maybe sometimes mention something in a, in a demo that, oh, we would like to have this instead and then three days later, you can get back to them and say, by the way, we now added this into our app. Um, then that is uh, sometimes a huge benefit to winning a deal. Um, so it was at the end of November 2018 when finally we got our version one launched. Um, and actually, it didn't really affect anything. Uh, it, it didn't. Uh, grow our sales numbers. Uh, we had lost some of the outbound and inbound deals uh, that we were reaching out to because we couldn't also iterate that fast on the existing prototype because we had our resources tied into this version one rewrite. Um, and the year ended on a rather sad note. Uh, we were running out of the funding. Uh, I remember our CEO tells a story where it's the New Year's Eve for him and at like 10 p.m. he just turns off his phone and, and it's like, I'm done with this year. Like, And we were all thinking at the end of the year that uh, if, if nothing else happens, if, if we don't get a miracle here, then uh, by the end of January, we're, we're most likely running out of money. Um, and then as you can imagine, because I'm here talking to you today, uh, we did pretty well. So it was the middle of January and we uh, landed two huge annual contracts and it actually happened on the very same day. It was a great day for us. Um, and then once we had that annual contract, when you were onto something and it kind of turned on a switch and every, everything sort of started happening. Um, 
Actually, it's it's almost like we developed some type of gravity towards Klaus. Um, so the person, Valentina, uh, who approached Martin from Automatic, she actually joined us as a, as a product manager. Um, we also got someone else. We were in a, in a Zendesk, um, kind of an incubator startup program. And um, the person who was the uh, an intern there at the startup program, um, she actually um, joined us as well because she just saw a clause in the startup program and, and thought we were a great company and a great product. Uh, we got some new customers at the, uh, the first half of the year and then built the rest of the, rest of the summer, really polishing the, the product, um, creating a lot more different integrations. So if you didn't use one of the main help desk solutions like Zendesk or Intercom or something else out there, then um, it was often that they weren't that big of a customer, but they were big for us at the time and they had this Bit of, bit of a different or less popular help desk service that we would just commit the resources and bash it out in like four or five days, create the integration for that help desk, and then we could get back to that customer and say, just for you, we created this now. Um, and those sort of short burst uh, focused efforts really helped our sales, I think, as well. Um, and then with the new customers that we got, we had a lot of scaling issues as well. <clears throat> um, we just uh, hadn't dealt with volumes like this before, and, and we hadn't designed the system from the ground up to expect these types of loads. So we did a lot of optimizing. Um, and, and I can remember it, it goes against a bit what developers usually think, because as a developer, I think your mindset is to build out this very universal, perfect solution that would, you know, you could, let's say you even make a small notes app or a grocery list app and you expect like all of Facebook users to start using it tomorrow and you think like, oh, this has to survive, et cetera. So you have these perfect scenarios in your head, but in a startup and in, in real life, you, you just, uh, you, you can't make do, you can't, you don't have the time or the resources to build out something like that. So um, I remember our CEO kept telling us uh, in 2018 and 2019, that's like, whenever we start discussing these hypothetical situations, but what if this now happens and we have this yada yada and she was, our CEO Martin was like, up, 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 I'm gonna stop you right there, gentlemen. That thing you're talking about, that's already a pretty good problem to have. So like, let's, let's get there first. Um, and then at the end of the summer, uh, we had a very surprisingly fast seed round. Um, we got approached by the early investors of Spotify, um, a Swedish in, uh, VC called Creandum. Mm. And they moved forward with us with incredible speed. I think it was a less than half a month process in total from contacting us to getting the papers signed, visiting them in their office, et cetera. Um, and then in the fall, we had a few new engineers join. Uh, we found ourselves an incredible CTO um, who has helped us out tremendously. I think he's the cornerstone, cornerstone of our engineering team. Um, and so we arrive at 2020. 2020 is a very exciting year. Um, at the start of the year, we're approached by very large customers like Epic Games. Um, they bring their own set of demands. Um, Let's see, I saw I had this small product demo that I'll run in the background. Uh, you can also find this on our website. It shows sort of what the product is today and what it does. <clears throat> and then with the volume of those big companies, we of course had new architectural challenges. Um, so we had to deal with those in the back end. Um, and then at the same time, while dealing with optimizing the infrastructure, et cetera, we also had to deliver the new features that, that some of our larger customers have, have demanded. Um, and I think that's that's just a battle that I don't have a great answer for. It's uh, always tricky when you have these huge customers who demand things or, or have those feature requests and you don't really want to tell them no because you wouldn't need their business. And at the same time, 
you want to align all feature requests with your own vision of your uh, product. Um, and then you can't really, even if you've hit uh, a, a bit of a growth spurt and, and everything seems to be going well, you can't really uh, just let things run the way they're running. You need to keep kind of innovating, disrupting something. So we did a lot of different experiments as well. Um, we, for example, with a very small team, uh, tested uh, out some outbound efforts and, and tried to do proper outbound uh, sales. <clears throat> but it was quite tricky because we didn't have a dedicated person for it. And uh, we're firm believers in that customer support agents that we have, they should also be the su uh, customer success managers. So that means that um, when you do and find clouds, then it's it's a single person taking you from start to finish, and they're familiar with your company, your needs, uh, your specific setup, and um, that's also great for your engineering team, I think, because when that company then might run into an issue or they have a new request, you have this single point of contact who knows their history and can explain their needs to the engineering team very well. So I think that served us great that. We didn't have this uh, separate sales and separate customer support department. They were uh, very fluid between the different phases uh, a client goes through. Um, another, I think, strong point uh, that we at Klaus have, it's uh, something that our competitors don't, is that we're, uh, we're very proud of our self-service. So that means you can sign up for Klaus today, any of you, and check it out. Check out the demo. Um, we, we have sort of a a demo mode where you land in where you can just leave the reviews etc and it, it helps out onboarding tremendously it means that in, even if you don't have uh, if you haven't booked like an official demo as an uh, inbound lead then you still you can discover the product on your own you can see if it's a good fit and then when you have some questions then you can like get in touch and that has i think helped kind of spread out the load of it and and also it's um, maybe just some people prefer it versus uh, like a full demo call or, or a phone call that they have to hop on. Um, and then, of course, you need to kind of stay in the picture. Um, so that takes me to the last section. Um, like just people love swag. That's what we discovered. I know it's not anything new, but uh, it's great. We're very proud of our uh, gimmicky swags. We have these. Uh, lapel pins, we have stickers, bridge magnets, we even have uh, our own socks that we ship over in a tuna can. Um, we have this lovely sleeping mask. Uh, we're very proud of our t-shirts and sweaters. And uh, it's very organic marketing. It just goes viral on its own, you know, and like, who doesn't love stickers? <laughs> um, and then just uh, to re reiterate that as a startup, I think uh, you, you need to understand that when you're doing something new, then you need to uh, kind of spread the word, get get in front of it. Um, and we've uh, tried to do that with uh, two of the terms that we've coined. So one of them is the conversation review that you saw at the start. And then another one is the internal quality score or the IQS that you can track with Klaus. Um, and we now notice that some of our uh, great uh, partners, like uh, help desks, like Intercom, they actually started using these terms also in their uh, like annual surveys and blog posts, etc. Um, so it just creates this awareness, and, and uh, you just see like a new term or something, and then you Google it, and then you find a close blog post about it, etc. And then you look into it some more, yada yada. Um, yeah. And then lastly, this is our team. Uh, as I said, we're fully remote, um, and we're quite proud of that. Um, I think what this has allowed us to uh, accomplish is namely we're, we're kind of spread out over time zones, which is important, um, especially in the customer support world. So as I said, we, we have this uh, sort of single personal contact for a company, and that means we won't, I don't think, ever out, outsource our customer support. It's something that is innate to us and organic and uh, I, I often do it as well um, and that means that it's great to hire remote because you can 
cover like US time zones or, or other time zones that your uh, team otherwise couldn't if you're located in a single position, I think. <clears throat> and then uh, if you found us interesting, if your company has a support team maybe of its own, um, I've created a small promo code, which is 202020, uh, which means next year 20% off uh, if you use it this year. And, and if not, and you're looking for an exciting new job, maybe check us out at closet.com slash jobs. Um, and lastly, you can find me or get in touch with me through GitHub. I think that's the best place or shoot me a message on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll also put the slides up later under my GitHub account.